I wanted to put this event on because I think it is so important to have uh, the the voices of the people who are being affected oh, talk yeah. about their uh, lived experiences, um, their direct experiences, and um, I am so excited to hear from our panelists today. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna have our panelists introduce themselves, uh, starting with Sonia, why don't you go first? Hi everybody, <laughs> I'm Sonia Lewis and I'm a UX researcher. Um, I was a healthcare provider for many years and was um, seeing people in private practice. They had some problems with their electronic health record and I decided that maybe I could do this better. So um, I actually have a disability. I have dyslexia and I'm passionate about hidden disabilities and advocating for those. So some of the answers tonight, I'll be speaking to those as well. Thank you so much. Uh, CJ, why don't you go next? Hey, I'm CJ Jensen. Uh, I've been working in UX for almost a year. Uh, before that, I was doing micromobility management for 35 communities across the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, one of them was in the greater Atlanta area. So Kennesaw Mountain, that, that area. So Georgia is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I, I have dyslexia, I have what's called information processing disorder, and I also have ADHD. So I was diagnosed very young, retested many times. I'm sure I'll get into it later. Perfect, thank you so much, CJ. Uh, Soren, why don't you go next? Hi everyone, I'm Soren Hamby. I use uh, they, them, theirs pronouns, and uh, I am a senior manager of UX and digital design. Uh, I also had our accessibility program uh, at work. I have uh, type 1 diabetes. I have a visual disability. I'm autistic. I have ADHD and chronic pain. So uh, I, I have a, a laundry list of, of things to that are both visible and invisible uh, disabilities. And I, I started having um, vision issues in 2016. And that's when I really got into accessibility because I started figuring out that I could almost not use any devices at all. I couldn't use any websites or like a podcast app, which you think would be really ideal for someone with a visual disability to listen to media, but it was just impossible. Uh, I'm actually from Alabama and I've spent a lot of time in, in Georgia. So, but I moved to, uh, I moved to the New York metro area in uh, 2017. So uh, I'm, I'm up here now, but thank you so much for having me. It's, it's feels like a slice of home to, to be here. Aw, I'm filled with the warm fuzzies. Um, and uh, we were going to have a fourth panelist, uh, Amanda, unfortunately, for personal issues. She wasn't able to make it today. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully she, she's okay. I'm sure she is. But uh, we wish her well. But thank you so much for the panelists who came and uh, the attendees who are here. Uh, I, oh, another thing is... Um, if you want to uh, make a comment towards the end, like um, we'll try to see if we can have time for a Q&A at the end. Um, you can put your questions in chat or if you have trouble with text, um, you can also use the raised hand um, option as well. Uh, but just save all your questions towards the end. Um, okay, so let's get started. I Let's just get this out of the way because I'm sure everyone is thinking about it. So let's just clear it out. Uh, how do you design with a visual disability? How do you do research with dyslexia? Um, anyone can answer that one. Soren, why don't you go first? <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, that is probably one of the biggest questions I get asked on a regular basis is I would have never, or they say like, I would have never known because of your work. And I'm like, uh, so there is a lot of uh, assistive tech out there that people use to get around uh, different disabilities. Uh, that's how, you know, we have like people that are deaf participate in meetings. I think we have captions on this meeting right now. Uh, that is a form of assistive tech. I have a huge screen uh, and I use things like um, voiceover if I'm having a, a time in my life where I'm 
have less visibility uh, and I have like a enlargers. You can actually have a lot of accessibility settings on any standard smartphone or computer just by going into, it's sometimes called the accessibility settings. Sometimes it's called, uh, I think it's called something else on Windows and I'm not recalling right now, but uh, there's just a lot of customizations that you can do to change text size, to change like contrast. So it's better for focus or uh, easier on your eyes. Uh, and that's that's the way that you get around a lot of things is that you just you just change how you operate just regular items. Fascinating. Uh, Sonia, CJ, um, how do you do research with dyslexia? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and speak to that. This is Sonia speaking. Um, so I use a lot of the same things that Soren was talking about. And one of the themes you're going to probably hear us uh, talk about tonight is that one disability might be accommodated in a way that another disability is accommodated in. So uh, a lot of what I use is mobile. So if you go to Mira, for example, Mira on a cell phone has different functionalities. And so you can speak uh, your sticky notes. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's a lot of those available that uh, people may not even be aware of. And also on LinkedIn, if you're trying to set up meetings with people, uh, you can do an integration there with Zoom and some of the other uh, types of meetings that you can have with people. So um, with dyslexia, I may have some challenges with what I see, but my ears work really, really well. So I'm a very good listener. So sometimes I can compensate some of uh, the challenges that I'm having as an adult diagnosed with dyslexia with uh, the listening skills that I have. And that's really important in UX research. Um, in research, and I've actually been working as a UX researcher um, since I got into UX, I've used uh, otter.ai a ton, and not just for um, when I'm doing interviews with users. I use it in meetings. I Every meeting that I have, I use otter, and um, it's been, it's actually been like super handy for every team that I've been on, because they're like, hey, I don't remember like what was said in that meeting, and I can go back and like highlight the directives, share the file with them, whatever it is, they're able to access it as well. Um, so I rely heavily on, on Otter. I also feel really lucky that a lot of the studies that I've done have been video studies. So whether it's like using user Zoom um, or DScout and being able to watch a person talk, I have a transcript and then I'm listening as well. So I can follow everything really well and pick up on like really important quotes. So that's that's kind of what's worked for me um, personally. Wow, uh, I think we're learning a ton already. <laughs> I see in the chat that people are like, oh, I didn't know uh, Miro had that or I, I didn't know other existed. Cool. Uh, second question is, um, you know, there is a saying, a disability is a spectrum. What does this mean? And why is it important for people to understand this? Uh, and this is open to anybody. Oh, first, I think a lot of times people, when they hear like disability as a spectrum, they think of like autism uh, or they think of, uh, you know, any number of, of different things, gender maybe even. Uh, but I, I feel like, it, you know, people don't understand that sometimes you don't start out with a disability when you begin your life. Some of us are diagnosed when we're, early in adolescence, sometimes as an adult, uh, sometimes you get one at one point and you get another diagnosis at another point. Uh, and a lot of us are misdiagnosed at some point. And uh, so it makes it hard for us to get that healthcare system that we have in the US. So uh, I would say that, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the recording uh, kind of- uh, sorry. Me off. No, it's okay. Uh, oh, I remember what I was going to say now. Uh, vision as being a spectrum over like either not being a binary choice of people either being able to see or not being able to see that there's things in between. And then also thinking about over time, uh, people having different amounts of, of vision or focus or anxiety, uh, like anything, anything like that. Uh, really is kind of a new concept to some people that don't live with a disability and haven't experienced it. So I think just like listening to the stories of people that do have a disability and understanding that, uh, you know, ability ranges over time, even for one singular person, 
um, is, is really a key thing to understand that concept. BJ, any thoughts on uh, yeah, disability um, in the spectrum? Totally. I was just going to say, I think a perfect example of that is happening right now. Sonia and I both have dyslexia. We both use different tools um, to manage our work. And, um, you know, I have even had people on Twitter who are like, oh, I'm dyslexic too. Like, how do you, um, how do you make a website like talk to you instead of like and explain things? I'm like, oh, you're thinking of a screen reader. Um, there's a reason I work from home and it's because I read everything out loud. So like, I, I can't help you. <laughs> um, but I try, I do try to be on, upfront with people when they ask, you know, what works for you? I'm like, this is what works for me personally, but um, you know, you're gonna find that it's different strokes for different folks who are on these spectrums. Um, one person who has dyslexia might say, like, I need an audio recording of every meeting. Someone else might say, um, I need a video recording because I need to see people's faces or something of that nature. And we're at a time in technology where like, D all of the above is possible. And I, I feel like I also, like being a person who has, you know, a bit of a hidden disability, it has made me way more empathetic. I also live with two people who have physical disabilities. And when you are interacting with people who have physical disabilities, it just makes you much more aware of how they use technology as well. And I feel like I bring a lot of that into my work. Yeah, I, I want to agree with uh, what CJ just said that I know that me having uh, a disability has made me more mindful of when I see, let's say, a, an audio or a video recording and it doesn't have a transcript. I know that as a member of the disability community, we can advocate for each other. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to do that. So when we don't see something that another person with a disability needs, especially the people that we've talked to, we've done research with, we can advocate for them. And it does give you that empathetic or uh, empathic mindset just to really look for those types of opportunities too. Um, and I believe somebody put something in the chat. Uh, I don't do very well with chat, by the way, but I think I saw something in the chat about temporary uh, disabilities. So let's talk about just one in particular. Um, with pregnancy, you've got a situation where the first trimester is a hidden disability. It A lot of times we don't think about it that way, but um, until 13 weeks, it's usually not clear for you to say something about it. And then once you have said something about it and you've gotten registered for FMLA or whatever it is, then it becomes a more visible disability. So I think part of the spectrum is also thinking about it from uh, season to season and time of life too, and these different spans that we have within things like pregnancy, which um, this is ladies at UX, I figured, you know, let's talk about pregnancy a little bit. Oh, that's such a good point. I actually never thought and framed it that way, but yeah, absolutely right. Thank you so much. All right, um, we're gonna start with Soren with this next question. Um, what are some common misconceptions from others that you encounter as a person with disability. So some misconceptions, examples of misconceptions I've heard are people with disabilities are hard to find and recruit. They're hard to accommodate in the workplace. Um, they're not gonna be able to perform or they're gonna need a lot of help. Um, these are not my words, by the way, <laughs> but I'm just saying these are misconceptions. Uh, have you run into these misconceptions, uh, Soren? Definitely some of those, especially about around recruiting. Uh, you know, I find the same thing it, with any kind of people that have been historically marginalized or excluded from the workforce. Uh, you know, like it's hard to find women that have this skill set. It's hard to find LGBTQ people plus people that have this skill set or have this skill or, you know, it's hard to find people of color that, uh, you know, are in this area, we find all those kinds of different excuses when people are talking about uh, marginalized groups. But I would say that the one I hear most as like a person with a disability is, uh, 
it'll be hard for you to fit in, or it'll be hard for us to accommodate you, or that's not the way that we do things here. And so people are sometimes not accepting of the, the different things that you have to do to be an inclusive environment, like allowing work from home, or uh, like, uh, just giving people the freedom to work in different ways because you know we have this idea of everyone works at the same time everyone works the same way we all use the same tools and while some of those are good to you know it's good not to have like some designers working in sketch and some working in figma it, not everybody thinks the same way even so it's not always time to go to figma maybe it's time to make slides or to work in Google Docs first or Confluence so that you can plot out some words before you get into visual ideas, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe you wanna do sticky notes or draw or doodle before you get into writing things. So I think just being more inclusive of people's different ways of working, uh, it benefits everybody, not just people with disabilities. It just benefits people that maybe have different sleep schedules or have family obligations of caregiving. So it really benefits everybody to give those kinds of accommodations. Great point, yeah. Uh, CJ, Sonia, do you have anything to add to that? Misconceptions oh. about disability? Absolutely. Um, I, like I grew up in a family where my mother is a, an interpreter for the deaf. My, one of my uncles is deaf. My other uncle is, uh, an interpreter and has done a ton of work for people with disabilities in the state of Utah. Uh, and then I, my grandmother is also an interpreter. And so I grew up around this community of people who had disabilities and were advocating for people with disabilities. And so for me, it was like, yeah, I always need to be advocating for someone else, um, but I never learned to advocate for myself. And so that has, I think that's been like the, the biggest um, realization at the age of 36 is like, oh wait, like you're advocating for everybody else, but you, and like you, you have a disability, like, come on. And I like the, the most mind blowing um, experience that I had was that my, I was doing a contract last fall and we hired a, um, a, an accessibility consultant who's deaf. And so I was like, great, um, I can help out. Like I know what to do. And my boss was like, how do we, how do we accommodate this person? And he was like, so afraid of accommodations that I was like, I, like, do you hear yourself? Because this is like comically terrible um, that people Oof. are so afraid of like doing the wrong thing that they actually do the wrong thing. And it's like, it's mm -hmm. okay to ask questions. It's okay to say you're deaf. Well, you need an interpreter. Can we provide you with one? Do you have one? how does this work? If someone is dyslexic and needs accommodations, nine times out of 10, like it's going to be really simple. And even if someone has a more complicated issue, they're going to tell you what they need so that you can make it happen. And it's really like a matter of like listening to people. When someone says, I'm autistic, I cannot, um, I, I, I get really overwhelmed you know, in big groups. So I can't come to a Christmas party, understanding that and saying, we totally get it. You know, well, can we have a smaller gathering with you and the people that, that you love being around at work or something to that extent so that people still feel included. It's honestly not hard. I've done a lot of those things for people, um, including like accommodating nursing moms and creating a nursing room at a place that I worked at. And it's amazing how people react at like the smallest accommodations, literally just like the tiniest speck of an accommodation. People are like, oh my gosh, you see me, thank you. And it makes a world of difference. On top of that, making sure that you don't make jokes about people's disabilities is also really important. Um, I had a boss who, when I was signing to our um, accessibility consultant, I don't sign well. Um, you know, I just said, you know, Hey, my name is CJ. And my boss was like, was she just like throwing her hands around or, or did you understand her? And I was like, I cannot believe you would say that. Like, this is beyond insulting to both me and him. And hearing someone say that, I was like, wow, you just don't get it. Like you don't get it. 
And so keeping those comments to yourself, that's an inside thought. Um, that's not an outside expression that you need to make. So making sure that like you, you know, you're being kind um, and you're being empathetic are two really important things. And, and understanding that no two disabilities are the same. Great point, thanks for sharing that. Um, I don't normally interject with uh, audience questions this early, but there is one that people are like, oh, I wanna know too. When do you actually disclose your disability to your employer? Do you? Um, and I, I see that there's been some conversation about it. I feel like I, I don't feel safe disclosing or I've heard mixed things. What is your take on this? I'm gonna, I can go ahead and answer that. Um, oh, this, yeah. um, so I think it starts from the very beginning. And, and that's just my experience that I wanted to share. Sometimes companies make it really easy in job descriptions that they're looking for people and they have an accessibility or an accommodation statement. Um, and one thing that as somebody who has dyslexia that I look for is I look for uh, if they have something not just in an email format, but also they give me the choice of calling because with dyslexia, I do things a lot quicker if I can talk it out as opposed to typing it out. And um, so if there is a accommodation uh, clause or a phrase or statement or what have you in a job description, you can ask and that can save both of you um, some of the time and heartache if they don't either uh, really know how to accommodate, you can start to figure those things out from the very beginning. I wish they all did, but not everybody seems to be at the same place with the accommodation process. Um, so that is one thing. And then with your accessibility needs around pregnancy, uh, typically people will start uh, somewhere in that end of the first trimester when they start signing up for things like FMLA or getting those benefits. Uh, I believe the first time you go to the doctor is somewhere between like eight and 12 weeks. Um, so it depends on what the disability is that you need to disclose. Um, but I'm just gonna speak to the ones that I know. I think there might be some other thoughts here with, uh, with our panel. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, I would say that, you know, I realize I'm coming from a place of privilege as a person that's white saying that like I disclose my disability really early on, but it's also is like super public because I speak on accessibility and it's like part of my writing. And uh, so it's, it's part of the story of how I got into accessibility, which people will always ask when you say like, I'm very, I'm very niche and skilled in accessibility. Uh, so I will caveat that. Um, but I, I also look for places that intentionally list themselves on websites that cater to uh, accommodation, like uh, inclusively and uh, other websites like Diversify Tech, which are specifically looking to hire marginalized people and specifically people with disabilities. So uh, when you look for places that are, you know, they're, they're looking to be inclusive, they're looking to hire people with disabilities and they've gone and they've done the research to find sites that are going to reach out to people with disabilities and have a roster already, then I think that, um, you know, that they are more likely to be accommodating every step of the way. Um, I also just like look for leaders that are also disabled. So, you know, I, I make it very clear to people upfront what the process is and that they aren't going to, to be surprised by, you know, having to go through a design challenge or having to whiteboard in front of me or anything like that, that it's entirely a behavioral interview to be on my team. And so I think it, I model the behaviors that I look for. And so I think looking for those sorts of things is, is really healthy if you're somebody that has a disability and you're wondering, is this a safe person to disclose to? Look for signs that that person is safe, but not every company is gonna be safe um, I have been even like, like intimidated and yelled at. And I mean, I would say abused because I have an insulin pump and because you can't turn the beeps on this off. And it beeped while I was in a meeting with another designer who, you know, told on me. And I was just like, I was so flabbergasted when it came up in a review that I, I, I couldn't, I, I don't have the words for it, but, um, 
it, so there's not going to be a company that's that's safe. Uh, whole whole uh, whole kit and caboodle, I would say. Uh, it depends on the team too, because there's some teams that you, a big enough company, you be some teams that are safe and some teams that are not. Wow, that's wild. <laughs> I'm sorry you went through that. Yeah, I, I've definitely had uh, similar experiences to Soren where I've had people like try to use it against me, like, oh, are you stumbling over your words because you're dyslexic? And I'm like, mm, that's rude. I'm going to firebomb your house later. I won't. I just say I will, but I, won't. <laughs> I promise. Oh my I'm God. very nonviolent, very nonviolent. Um, but uh, I definitely have re read up a lot on disability law. And when, you know, when I'm covered by it, when I'm not, a lot of times, if you are not a W-2 contractor, um, the ADA does not cover you. And you can ask for accommodations an employee, an employer can give them to you. Like that's, that's totally fine, but they are not obligated to do that. If you're a contractor, again, who's not under a W-2 contract. Um, so that's something that really like blew my mind when I started really looking into like making sure I was getting accommodations, making sure that people that I knew needed accommodations were getting them. And I, I really try to be, um, like an advocate for my coworkers who have disabilities that maybe like don't want to talk about them. And they're like, hey, like I really need to be able to work in, not in a crowded office. I mean, this was pre-pandemic, uh, but not work in an open concept office and have like a place where I can work for a couple hours and advocating for them to be able to, you know, block out a conference room and work from there for a couple hours. I also like did that for myself at the last company that I was in person at and my coworkers would call me the office house cat because I would follow the sun like from like conference room to conference room and I had because I was like I just work better in the sun and I need my headphones on and like people would have meetings with me sitting in the corner and I would just be working away with my like noise canceling headphones on and it was just like a known thing in the office like don't bother them they're doing their thing. They're not going to bother you. They're not going to tell your secrets if you're saying any on a call with a client. And so like, it was really great to have that understanding with my entire office. Like we were very, we were all very close, very open with each other. And so it was, the attitude was like, if you disrespect someone, like we're all going to hear about it. And so you need to be respectful of people. Um, and bigger companies that can be really hard. So I, anytime I ask for accommodations at a new company, I always make sure that, it, that HR is there, a representative from HR and my boss. And I do ask if I can record the conversation as well, because I feel it's really important that I am documenting these kinds of conversations um, so that I can also refer back to them um, to make sure that I said what I needed and they said they would accommodate me. Um, so I try to really just make sure I'm, I'm crossing my T's, dotting my I's all the time when I'm, when I'm asking for those accommodations. And if people come to me and they're like, can you help me get this accommodation? Um, I also try to help them get what they need as well, so. Oh, that's great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question, I'm gonna start with Sonia. A lot of companies claim to care about accessibility and inclusivity. Do you find that companies accommodate people with disabilities well? Well, I hate to use the answer, it depends, <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately, I think that's the answer I'm going to have to give. Um, so what I find in, in, in my research and in talking with people is that it's uh, very dependent on a few things. Uh, if it's more common, so something that involves uh, vision or blindness or screen readers or things like that, it seems like that happens a lot faster. Uh, than some of the other disabilities. So hearing loss might be one of the more common ones, but dyslexia, as we've talked about some here uh, in the panel, um, it is often misunderstood too. Um, and there's a spectrum. So there are some disabilities that are hidden that sometimes people look at you and they're like, oh, you look like you understand or uh, because sometimes we're masking, you know, we're 
looking at things and, and trying to put on that face <laughs> while we're in meetings and here's the chat and we're trying to follow it and that type of thing. Um, and so there are some of those kinds of situations out there that might take longer. Um, most recently, I was uh, in a situation where I had a lot of support from a third party contractor that hires people in UX to be on contracts and great, great people to talk to. I had disclosed my disability, I'd asked for my accommodations, I had a set of things that I was asking for, and they put it forward to the client. And it ended up uh, that the client was very, you know, we're going to totally help you and that type of thing. And it's a large organization. So they were having to go through a lot of hoops to get that accommodation through and pass it through. So if you can imagine, you know, you're being hired to work on a contract. And if they're going to take all this time to do that, that's a very expensive process if you don't have it at day zero or day uh, one when you actually start your job or day 30 or whatever it is early on in the process. So the people that are coming to do contract work for you, it affects multiple people if we don't have these types of accommodation um, types of processes in play or an expedited process. Uh, a lot of companies have a different uh, policy for contractors. Uh, I think CJ was mentioning like a W-2. So the W-2 sometimes gets treated a little bit differently than a regular contract or an in-house employee. So I think it's really important also when we're interviewing that we ask those kinds of questions. Um, have you accommodated for this particular tool before? Uh, and the tools that I was asking for are things that other people are like, oh, I didn't even know this existed. So they're things that benefit a lot of people. So one of them is called Loom, which is a screen recorder. And when you go into uh, the screen recorder, you can actually uh, populate a transcript. You can go in and make the changes to the transcript and it also gives captions. So it's highly accessible. It's something that a lot of different groups of people can use, especially if we're thinking about things like accessibility defects and things that we work on every day. Um, so just a really good tool. But again, the support locally was there, but the support at the system level really needed to change. So I think some of these, uh, these answers are gonna be based on the system. If we can actually do some change management or some grassrootsy kind of stuff to help advocate for each other, you're gonna hear that word a lot here, advocating um, for dis different disabilities, we'll be able to help push that through, I think a lot quicker. And then just recognizing that it takes a lot of hours if we don't have that policy in play. And I will say, uh, I know Slack just uh, released uh, like a voice memo and a video memo uh, feature. And I think that's great. Uh, I mean, I use it just for asynchronous design reviews, which is, uh, I, again, when you design with accessibility in mind, you benefit a lot more people. <laughs> um, and my next question uh, is going to be for CJ. Um, what are some of the most frustrating things about being a person with disabilities um, in this field? Um, I feel like sometimes, uh, like, I don't 100% know how to answer this because, like, I like last week came to like the sudden conclusion that like having dyslexia is actually my superpower in UX because I can look at screens and be like, I don't know what the hell you're trying to do here because my cognitive load is so high. I can't figure this out. And like telling designers that they're like, oh, oh, okay. Well, like, what should we change? And like being able to like talk about it. I mean, I also, if you couldn't tell, I'm like very forward. And so like, I think that helps because I'm, I, I don't have a filter. I don't know how to have a filter. I just kind of like give it pe to people straight and, and try to have empathy as well when I'm giving it to them. Um, and so I feel like I've been pr like pretty well accommodated. Um, but one thing that was like really hard to deal with at the last company that I was at was that, um, because it was healthcare and things are very, very regulated and companies are, are very locked down with their information, um, I couldn't record meetings in Otter. And it was so frustrating. And they were like, we can't even record meetings in Microsoft. Like we're not allowed to, like the, the, the 
hoops that we have to jump through are so great. And I was really thankful that I had a boss who um, really only invited me to meetings that I absolutely had to be at. So if I was presenting data, that sort of thing. So I wasn't like constantly overloaded with information that had nothing to do with my work, which was really helpful because it gave me the time to um, be able to do my work and do it well. Um, so that's something that I've realized is like, if I don't need to be at a meeting, I'm not going to be because it severely affects my ADHD as well. I have only so many spoons that I can get out in a day. And if I am absolutely tuckered out mentally by noon, you're not getting anything from me for the rest of the day because I just mentally cannot handle it. And so being upfront about that has made a huge difference. And also telling people like, I'm not attending this meeting unless there's an agenda has also made a difference because then people are forced to, um, gently forced, I will say, to make sure that this meeting actually needs to happen. And if they're like, oh, I, you know what? It doesn't need to, that makes a huge difference. Or being able to say to someone like, hey, can you just do a screen recording of this so that I can look at it tonight if you don't get an answer right now and like nine times out of 10, someone's like, oh my gosh, yeah, I can totally do that. Like I'll send you the file. I'll make a recording, like no big deal. And that's been really cool. Um, being able to educate people as well as, you know, if, if they're like, oh my gosh, you need this accommodation. And being like, bro, like this is, this is UX, like all kinds of people need accommodations. Like mm -hmm. this is not a me thing. This is like a world thing. Yeah. Um, has also made a difference and helped me help my coworkers kind of open their minds to the, the greater needs of users. Um, CJ, uh, I just saw a comment in the chat. Could you quickly explain the spoons analogy for people who are not familiar with that? Oh my God, I'm so bad at explaining it. <laughs> oh, well, I can explain it. It's basically your energy level. Actually, in my, um, I work on a comic outside of UX and we have like a, an auto bot that asks, what is everyone's spoon levels today? And so we'll say, oh, I'm at three spoons. Don't ask me to do anything hard. So that's that's the spoon thing that CJ is talking about. <laughs> I, I like to joke that I have a total of 10 spoons every day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so like work takes like seven of them. And mm -hmm. like the other three need to go to like me exercising or like making myself food. So mm -hmm. Like I try to like keep that in mind for myself as well as making sure people understand where I'm at. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, Soren, uh, the next question is going to be for you. Uh, especially since you are in a management role, how can we successfully get product and engineers to think about accessibility from the very start? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have actually been dealing with that a lot because I'm dealing with a development team right now that is very new to accessibility. I find, especially with dealing with offshore teams, because in different countries, the accessibility laws are so different and the guidelines are so different that you can't really get everybody coming into the situation with the exact same knowledge. It's just impossible. So I think here documentation is really, really, really important. And you can't just throw um, the WCAG guidelines at people and be like, here's this really dry, really long thing. Please digest this. Like you really have to curate some resources that work for your team of like where you really want to focus um, because there's different levels of accessibility compliance and there's different, um, there, there's just like different uh, things that you can focus on as far as like, do, do we want to um, be like AA level compliant? Do we want to be compliant with like 2.0, 2.1? Um, so there's a lot of like really technical things that you can use to get people on the same page, but then it also comes down to like interpretation. So you have to have enough people that can give that interpretation. And I think like putting it into the requirements, putting it into the design, and then putting it into the testing as well uh, it is really, really key. Uh, of course, like having people with disabilities on the team, I think is super important and, and is not made up for by doing testing with people with disabilities, because you can 
you can head off a lot of problems because if you show me something that doesn't have labels on the form fields, I'm going to be like, excuse me, <laughs> uh, we need to have labels on these form fields because placeholder text is not sufficient. As soon as you put a cursor and that people with ADHD are going to go, I forgot what I'm doing here. <laughs> and people that uh, need like the, the screen reader feedback are going to be like, Sorry, I, I don't know what I'm doing here either because you didn't tell me because that was placeholder text um, and it doesn't have a label on it. So, you know, you can sort of build those things into the design. I would say like also setting people up for success with documentation, you can use the design system. So if you are focused more on uh, like building and socializing this design system at first, it seems really daunting. But once you get past the stage of like having all the, the Lego blocks that you need to make a website or a, an app, then you can get to solving bigger problems. Like how do we design features that meet the needs of people with accessibility concerns? Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the perspective that I have on it. I don't know if Sonia or CJ, you, you all wanna add anything else to it. Sorry, what was the question again? Uh, of getting the, the dev and engineering team on board with and accessibility concerns. Um, I typically like to ask um, product teams if they want to make money for the company and if they like making money. And when they're like, yes, I'm like, great. So you're gonna build an accessibility. Um, and I like to remind people that it's, it's important that we include accessibility in our work, not just because we legally have to, um, but because if you actually want people to use your product, you need to build it for people. Um, and I had a case of working at a company where we, the product we had designed, people had felt like it was really for youthful millennials living in cities. And the product was actually being used by people who were like 45 plus, typically living in Florida who ride recumbent bikes. And like recumbents are not as sexy as young people in cities. Like, you know, but the truth is like, that is who is using your product. Thus you need to tailor more to them to some degree and make sure that your product accommodates these people who are over 50. If people have a hard time over 50 and, and it's a smartphone app, you, you, need, you need to make sure that people can see the visual as well and that sort of thing. Um, but if I, I just try to explain that to people. Um, I can be pretty snarky when people push back and um, make sure that they understand that like their ableism is not okay. Um, that's something that I really try to focus on and make sure that they understand that like you don't know if someone has a disability or not. You don't know if one of your designers has a disability that they don't feel comfortable telling you about. You don't know if you have a developer with a disability and you are straight up insulting them when you talk about how that you don't want to focus on accessibility. Um, I've said it before on Twitter and I'll say it again, if designing with accessibility in mind hinders your creativity, you're not that creative. Um, put it on my tombstone. And I think it's really important that we look at accessibility as a, a chance for us to like stretch and grow and as artists, if you will, um, and be able to make for, pe for all people, you know, not just people who look like us or talk like us or um, that sort of thing. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, our next one is also for CJ. What's the best way to test and research with users uh, with disabilities? What's the best way to recruit them and also to accommodate them in the actual usability testing? Totally. Um, I have not done, a, full disclosure, I have not done a lot of um, testing with users who like use a screen reader. Um, but when it comes to, I have done a lot of like user testing with like very niche groups like sneakerheads and with populations that are 65 and older. 
Um, and the thing that I found is if you want to attract these users, you need to go to where they are. So if you need to talk to like 20 sneakerheads, you need to find where sneakerheads are hanging out online. If you need to talk to people with um, cerebral palsy, get on Twitter and, and talk to people. There's also probably groups of people that you can talk to and say, hey, like I'd love to be able to talk to you about your experience. Um, there's a really fantastic uh, disability rights advocate. Her name is Imani Barbary, I think, on Twitter. She goes by Crutches and Spice. And if you want to learn about disabilities, follow her. Um, she, mm -hmm. I've also like DM'd her and been like, hey, I have a quick question about this thing. It's a small question, um, but you can also, she's a person that you can contract with. Um, so actually going to these people and saying, I have questions and I need to learn and I need, I need your help with this product. Anybody or not anybody, most people with a disability are gonna say, yeah, that's great. Um, most studies you're paying people, so you're obviously going to pay them for their time. Um, I have found that because I have older parents, when I need to test things with people over 65 that may have vision issues or aren't um, full time internet users, if you will, asking if I can talk to their friends has been greatly useful. Mm. Um, and nine times out of ten, I'm like, I just want to talk to you about a website. I don't key them into like what we're going to be talking about. Um, I asked them like, what device do you typically use too? And sitting with them and watching them use their device and go through a website has been so eye-opening for me. And maybe these, these processes were a little bit more time consuming and not everybody has time to go out and, and, and find these people all of the time, but making that effort will make a huge difference in the feedback that you get. Even if mm. you're only able to talk to two people who use screen readers, it's better than zero. So true. Uh, do you wanna add anything to that, Sonia? Yeah, I'm gonna add. Um, so in my prior life, I was a wellness manager. And a lot of times I work directly with employee resource groups. A lot of companies will call them associate resource groups or affinity groups. So we're talking about like women in tech or Latins and labs or whatever the group is. Um, there are a lot of these uh, groups now that are accessibility groups too. So you can also test things internally if you don't have a contract mechanism or you don't have a way to do some of the research doing the testing, getting input and co-designing uh, is another way to help uh, make sure that things are accessible. And then of course, hiring people with disabilities. I know it doesn't capture everything, but it will get you closer to where you need to be. Um, I was also on a presentation earlier today with DeQ um, and they were talking about if we use the automated tools, uh, we could catch about 57% on average of the accessibility issues. Um, so there's, there are some things that you can do that just need to be done every time. And then there's this part of the accessibility um, testing that we want to do with specific groups of people. And then, of course, like Fable does some, uh, some accessibility research. Uh, I did a contract with them for um, people with screen readers, people that needed to use magnification. So there are some that are a little bit easier to find out there. And that is one of the groups that does a pretty good job of it too. So there's a few different things. And then of course, uh, partnering with nonprofits uh, that also advocate in the same areas. Yeah, I just want to jump in there too yeah. with the, the whole like automated testing thing. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of divide accessibility issues into subjective and objective issues. So objective issues are things that like you can check if something is there or not there. So you can check and see if there are alt text properties for an image, but you can't check to see if it's right with an automated checker. You have to know the editorial intent of the photo in order to know if the description is right. And it's the same thing with buttons. If you ever go to a website and there's a bunch of buttons that just say shop now, shop now, shop now, each one of those needs to tell you where it goes because there's some people that browse by buttons, browse by links, 
And they're just jumping to each of those buttons. And if they're all named the same thing, it's like looking at a sea of squares that all look the same. It's essentially what you're doing to people that are browsing the website with different technology. Uh, and so there's these objective issues and there's subjective issues and subjective issues always need a person's input. So there's no way that you can ever use any AI tool or anything that can know your intent. Um, so I just want to impress that upon everybody because there's a lot of AI tools out there that claim to like protect you from litigation or make your site 100% accessible or check for all errors. And there is nothing out there that will ever replace talking to people. <laughs> and, and that's true of user experience in general, right? Um, there's nothing out there. There's no pattern library or anything that will ever replace talking to a human about the specific issues that they find in their lives and like gathering data on that um, because we're not machines and, he, and machines will probably never get to the point where they can emulate exactly the experience that a human goes through. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to harp on that for a moment that uh, we, can't, we can't detect everything with automation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's actually really good. I never heard of the um, objective versus subjective checks. So thank you for that. Uh, speaking of uh, these assistive technologies, as designers and people who are creating this tech, um, what's, are there some like just general best practices when designing products, um, when keeping assistive tech in mind? That's open to anyone. <laughs> I try to remind people a lot that your color choice makes a huge difference. I mean, at the most basic level, the color choices you have and this, the type of um, typeface that you're using and the size, I'm like, at a base level, that needs to be something that you focus on from the beginning. Um, that shouldn't be an afterthought. But I'm sure Soren has far more, far more better info than me. Um, I'm happy to jump in there with uh, a couple of tools. Um, one would be um, getstark.co. And I talk about them a lot because they're one, a great resource as a community because their product has a community. Um, and also they have a, a fantastic product that's always evolving and they're coming out with some new stuff really, really soon. Uh, their beta inks and things right now. So I would say this is a really good place to get in on, on some of their, their newest technology, but um, they have a tool that you can use with uh, Figma and Adobe XD and um, Sketch that you can use to check contrasts in your design documents. There's, uh, there's a contrast tool for Mac. I know that I have it like on my Mac right now that I can check contrast any on any screen because it's part of my toolbar. Cool. Um, uh, Jordan, the, the, the tool is uh, Stark and the website is getstark.co. Uh, and I, I just really, the team there is so dedicated to accessibility. They're really not there to build just a product, but they're there to, to make the world more accessible. And so I think that's really the key to the reason they built a really strong community is that they're they're rallied around a cause. And uh, so I find that there's a lot of great resources there because people are there just like giving accessibility knowledge all the time. I'm one of them. Uh, so there's people that are like, hey, I have this issue with contrast, for instance, like somebody else is telling me that headers don't have to be contrast accessible. And we're like, uh, hey, so we can help you with that, uh, that difference in opinion there. Um, <laughs> difference of opinion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the matte contrast checker is just called contrast and it's in the, it's in the app store. Um, that's where I found it. Uh, but in any case, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of benefit to having contrast. Like we've, we keep saying like accessibility benefits everyone. If you're ever on your, your device in a lighting situation where there's a lot of glare, then you know that sometimes things don't appear as 
beautifully as on a Mac with a retina screen and, you know, like perfect calibration. So, you know, you're on a train, like squinting at your phone going, uh, there's, there's a glare, like contrast benefits that person. That's what we call a situational disability. So, you know, you have situational and temporary and permanent disabilities. And so things like contrast really, really benefit everybody. Uh, it makes things more legible. So uh, anyways, I, I feel like I've taken up enough space on this question. Sonia, do you wanna, do you wanna uh, add anything here? Cool. Um, and just for time, uh, I'm gonna, uh, for the, our panelists, I'm gonna jump to a couple of questions here. Um, I'm sure that there, there are some people who make hiring choices in the audience. What do you want those people to know when it comes to accommodating people in the job hunting and the, um, the interviewing process? Sonia, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can I can go ahead and start. Um, so some of the accommodations um, are, again, things that we were talking about that are not just presenting information in typing. So, you know, for me, I always look for starting with the job description, like, does it offer a choice of how I interact with a recruiter? Is it only an email that I can send? Is that statement also including a phone number? So those kinds of things just like allow me to quickly get to like, what are the accommodations? What do they have? What are the things that, um, that I might be able to, um, to find out ahead of an interview so that I can be more prepared? Um, but there are gonna be things like, uh, tools that create captions, tools that have audio and transcript presented with them. So things like Slack Pro, again, is one of them, uh, Loom Business, the enterprise version handles some of the uh, retention questions. So some of the security issues that CJ brought up earlier with regulatory and um, also with like financial organizations, they may not want you recording things. Um, it's very interesting, like the stakeholders want to see the interviews um, and hear directly from the customers, but then they don't want to have these recording tools. So it's, it's a very interesting conversation to have to understand a little bit more too about what are the grounds if they have a screen recording tool as opposed to just an audio one too. So those are some of the things. Um, and then the assistive tech. Uh, things like the privacy screen, uh, Soren was mentioning the color contrast in dark mode. So there are a lot of those kinds of things that are there. And then also do they issue a mobile phone for everyone? Um, because again, more of the voice commands, like even like LinkedIn, you can do things on your phone that you can't do on the actual uh, desktop laptop version of it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll jump into some audience questions. Uh, and the final question, uh, we'll go ahead and start with Soren. Uh, how does being a person with disability affect your other identity groups, such as being LGBTQ, um, being a woman or non-binary, being a person of color? Um, this will be for everyone, but Soren, let's start with you. Sure. So uh, I find that uh, it's a little bit difficult sometimes because you find that in, um, you know, maybe like one group, like in disability community, they're very conscious of, of maybe. Oh, sorry. Person. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I, I couldn't hear what you said. Uh, well, I'm not sure. Not sure what happened there. I think it was an accident. I'm, I'm gonna mute that person um, just in case they have background noise going on. Oh, okay. Uh, any case, I was just saying that um, I, um, I find that in some groups, like in the disability community, there's a lot of accommodations for events. Um, and there's, there's a, a, a lot of understanding about some of my other identities. Uh, but I find that sometimes outside of disability community, there's a, not a lot of understanding for that. Um, and I know that there's a lot of other people that also experience that intersection of, of the competing needs or, or competing, um, or compounding identities. 
but uh, I find that like one of them is that there's a lot of ableism in the in the LGBTQ community. I know that we also have a huge problem with like racism and uh, you know even like transphobia in some parts of the community. So it it's can be it can be really hard to find, but particularly as a person with with disabilities to find uh, like accessible venues. Uh, you try to find a venue that's friendly for LGBTQ plus person, but it doesn't have a ramp. Um, you try to find, um, you know, you try to find this middle ground. Sometimes even a disability community can be ableist towards neurodiverse people. So it, it's, or neurodivergent people. It's, it's a really a difficult kind of intersection sometimes to, to find yourself at. Um, but I would say that it's not a, a situation that's unique to me or the intersections that I face. Uh, and then someone had a specific question. Um, Isia Isai uh, had a question about, do you, um, CJ and Soren, do you have trouble uh, getting other people to respect your pronouns in the tech world? Um, seems like they have uh, issues with that. Uh, it depends on the person, I would say, for me. Um, there are some people that say, like, you don't understand. I'm from outside New York City. And uh, like, this is hard for me. I've been working with you for six months and this is really hard on me. And I'm like, oh, is it? I, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, but uh, yeah, but some people, they take to it really well. And they're like, you know, you're the first person that I've met with that uses they them pronouns that I know of. But uh, you know, I'm I'm really trying, and I can tell that they're really trying, um, and that like I notice that they stop themselves before they misgender me, or that they correct themselves. The CEO of my organization stopped in a in a DEI board meeting the other day, misgender me, and then stopped himself and then corrected himself, and I I just had never felt so proud of it. <laughs> Of, of a cisgender man in my life. Uh, it was just like, I was just, it was just a moment because I was like, you know, if he does that, then that proves that everyone else in this company that is just like him can do it too. Um, so it, it really depends. Um, it, it does, but I, I would say that just like trying to, for allies especially, to do things like put your pronouns if you feel comfortable, putting your pronouns places where people can access them. Um, you know, like if you're a person that is in a position of power to try to, you know, like or authority to, to try to make it normal for your team to share. Like I still am the only person that shares pronouns sometimes, but my team has started to do it too. So now I'm not the only person that does it. And even though there's no other trans people on my team, my entire UX team has started doing it. And it just warms my heart so much uh, that people will stick up. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it is a, a difficult thing. And like CJ said, self-advocacy is sometimes really hard because you're like, oh gosh, like I, I don't know if I really wanna like make people uncomfortable with my discomfort, but I, I really do wanna make the kind of environment for my team that they feel comfortable too. And I never know if somebody coming into my team is gonna be trans or non-binary. So I really wanna make that space for them. So it's worth the, the try. Thank you. And um, panelists, are you okay uh, sticking around for a little bit longer? Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. Um, Sonia and CJ, uh, quick thoughts on intersectionality before we go into Q&A. Totally. I, so um, I am femme presenting, I realize that. And so um, a lot of people will be like, she, 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 she. And I'm like, mm, let's stick to the they. And I've had like coworkers that this is the first time that they are working with someone who's non-binary. And when they get it wrong, I just send them a little Slack message and be like, hey, don't forget, I'm a they then. Um, and I had a coworker who he was like, I'm so sorry, I, I'm going to try really hard. And like the next time we had a meeting and he referred to me, he said she, and then he was like, they, and like, he is this like 60 something year old dude in like the woods of Minnesota. And I'm like, thank you. And every time someone's like, this is really hard. I'm like, you know, the name of every single Pokemon, so you can't remember <laughs> someone's pronouns, like no, I'm sorry. Like, I can't, I can't accept that. 
And I even tell people like, it's okay to like write down someone's name and the pronouns they use, or even ask them every single time. If you can't remember, if I didn't know Soren's pronouns and every time I was in a meeting with them, I was like, can you remind me of your pronouns? Can you remind me of your pronouns? I am 100% positive Soren would not be like, they're a terrible person because they always ask me. No, <laughs> we're very happy that you ask. And it's totally okay to say like, hey, I'm a they them. Um, I had the, the blessed opportunity to go to a, a boot camp, Prime Digital Academy, where every single meeting we had to introduce ourselves with our pronouns. And so that for 18 weeks, like once a day, I'm CJ, they, them, little she. Um, and it was amazing because I would talk with cis men who, if they didn't give me their pronouns, I would still ask. And they were like, oh, I, well, I'm a, I'm a he, him. I'm like, well, great. You let me know if it changes. You know, and just opening that space to them that you, I don't know, maybe you're a they, them tomorrow, you know, and letting them know that it's okay to, to be themselves made a huge difference. Um, and I, I, I try to respect, not try, I feel like I, you know, respect people's pronouns or if they have a name that they want to go by that maybe isn't um, in their email address, you know, that's really important. Um, it's just like, how people don't want to be called a nickname that they didn't agree with, you know, like don't call them something that they don't want to be called. Um, and I, I do want to go back to um, the question of, you know, how do I stand up for myself? I, I do believe that was a question or something around there. Um, when it comes to like advocating for yourself, your gender, your disabilities, it's perfectly okay to on your first day or, you know, before that, if you will, to say like, hey, this, these are the things that I want my coworkers to know about me or I want my team to know about me. Um, nine out of 10 teams are gonna be like, okay, thank you, right on. You know, and the team that's like, mm, we can't, we can't. Like that's, a, that's, a, that's the biggest red flag. Like that's, that red flag is, it's waving so hard. Um, and that's something I also try to look at. And even when I'm interviewing with a team, I, will ask them like, what kind of accommodations have you given to people with disabilities in the past? Um, I even ask about like what their um, maternal or parental leave policy is. I will never have children ever, but I try to bring it up so that they know like, this is a thing that people are looking for. People wanna know these things. And even if it's not for me, being able to advocate for people who are birthing or people who have a disability that's different than mine, knowing that up front. Mm -hmm. at like how they're going to react to these things makes a huge difference in how safe I feel in that workplace. And if I, if in a job interview, I don't feel safe, I'm just like, have a nice life. <laughs> right. I realize that we don't all have that opportunity to turn a job down. Um, yeah. But I promise your people are out there. And if you're not working for a company right now that respects you, you will find a company that does. Thank you. Sonia? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, so I, I appreciate both of, um, both Soren and CJ sharing that. I had an opportunity to uh, lead a design guild and training for the designers and one of the organizations that I worked with. And we specifically created a scenario of a character that was gender neutral. We were trained the best we could and I caught myself many times. I know a Pat that's female, so it was really hard for me, but it helped me again, you know, just to go ahead and, and have that experience of talking. And I kept just going back to Pat's name, you know, when I couldn't get it right and kept catching myself because I kept seeing the person <laughs> as I was like thinking about it. Um, but eventually it, it helped, you know, just to be a little more mindful. So I think that we all have an opportunity as advocates to help with education, with uh, including characters, stories, sharing these anecdotes. I mean, it's really important to let people know. And again, I'm not from New York City either. So, you know, I spend most of my life in Alabama and Texas. 
So um, I'm not used to it either. So I think that uh, we can all be advocates for each other because no one wants to feel like another. I don't as somebody with dyslexia, um, my friends don't as uh, someone who uses a different gender than what we're used to using when we talk about people. So I need to be respectful as well because nobody wants to feel like another. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I know we are over time, but we'll go and do a little bit of Q&A. Ying, if you want to help moderate, but um, as Ying is prepping for that, let's go ahead and take ourselves off mute and applaud our amazing speakers. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Ooh. 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 Yay. And if you do have to leave, don't forget to uh, connect with our speakers today. Um, I'm sure they would love to hear your questions, experiences. Uh, they're on LinkedIn, uh, so you can also connect with them. And um, how about we go into 8.20? Is that OK, panelists? OK. Yeah. yeah real, real quick, I just wanted to add, if you add me on LinkedIn, please write a message. Otherwise, I will straight up reject your, your request, because I don't know who you are. Yes. Um, and I, I want to get to know you and I want to, you know, answer questions you have or talk about, if you want to talk about quilting, I'm a quilter. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about canning or gardening. Like I'm about it. Um, just let me know who you are um, and, and how we met. And that would be great. Cool. Yay. What's our first question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, it's been nice that you actually picked out some of the questions from the chat to tackle as well. So mm -hmm. now we only have a few, but if there are any more questions, please add them to the chat and we'll make sure that we can get to it. Um, the first one was from Ada from just earlier in the conversation asking about for UX research, like how do you recruit for persons with disabilities? I know we um, talked about a few resources, but if we want to bring them up again or any additional helpful uh, resources that might be helpful with that. Yeah, I also um, would second Fable. They're doing a great job in the space uh, with making sure to uh, recruit people with disabilities and that they're, you know, a very specialty niche um, group for that. You also can recruit people with disabilities on, you know, just like usertesting.com or, you, you know, any of these other platforms that are out there. Uh, you can put screening questions so that you can say like, we're, we're looking to uh, include people with disabilities in our testing and, and like even specify that these kind of accommodations are provided because a lot of people don't create prototypes that includes screen readers. Um, so, you know, that's, that's like just one example of how you can put out there that you will be accommodating and then that will help people know that, you know, they could come test with you. Um, and it makes them more likely to, to put themselves out there. Uh, I think CJ also brought up, or Sonia brought up the point of like going where people are uh, to recruit. And that's also a really great, really great point to, to surface. I, I also think um, like if you're working on a product that has an established customer base, going to your customers, sending out an email and working with marketing and saying, hey, like we need to test with people um, and sending out a, a well-worded email with a link to a survey so that you can get their information and set up a time. People appreciate that. Your customers appreciate knowing that you are trying to go the extra mile, that you're trying to do, do right by them. Um, and I, I think a lot of people are always worried about getting negative feedback from stuff like that. And it's like, you have to take the, the good with the bad. So if someone does respond and, and say something terrible, you ignore it because they're not your target audience right now. Um, so I, I, I've time and time again told uh, companies that I've worked for, like, look at your customer base. You'll be really amazed at, at the things that you you don't know about them. I wanted to, to add to that too, sorry. Um, so the Sonia, um, I was gonna add that also, um, I know CJ mentioned surveys. So if you do send out a survey, make sure it's not just in typing. I know I've said that point a few times, but 
you know, we wonder why we don't have a good survey turnaround. There's incentives involved, there's timing and depending on how long it is, but also uh, could you also allow people to submit a video, an audio? Do you have a phone number that people could use? Um, so think kind of a little more broadly uh, typing and something. <laughs> Yeah, I would also just quickly interject that the opposite is true that, you know, I was talking with someone recently that was like, I work at an audiology clinic and we don't allow people to schedule appointments by text message. And that seems backwards that you can only, we work with people that are hard of hearing and deaf and you can only schedule appointments by phone. Uh, so, you know, just really thinking about who you're trying to reach and, and maybe like what you're lacking to be able to reach those people, um, especially and offering a variety of ways for people who think different ways and communicate different ways. Yeah, That's great. a really great point. I'm just like thinking of the entire um, process to uh, all the different touch points and then seeing like, hey, is this actually in alignment with our values and with our core objectives too? Or else it's kind of like, as you said, there's this little bit of like cognitive dissonance of like, or just a disconnect of like, oh, actually, this doesn't seem to be in alignment. Um, Sonia, sorry, were, were you going to say something too? No, I was just going to say, I think the problem with a lot of this is in the only, right? If it's only in typing or only in audio or only in video. So the more that we can do that intersection where we're trying to like cross pollinate or cross advocate, the better we're going to be off. So yeah, just giving people choice of how they want to interact with the information. Yeah. One thing that I found really works too when advocating for like a different um, medium for people to like respond to something is like doing the work to say like, this is the exact program we can use so that people can text us. This is what we can use. And this is how much it costs um, if we want people to be able to submit video and things like that. So that there's like they, it, people have a harder time saying though when they have the full picture in front of them. And so I try to remember to, to bring all of that information to the front. Um, yeah, there's there's so many issues with like audiology clinics and, and all kinds of doctor's offices that you're like, why aren't you scheduling this way? And nine times out of 10, it's because no one in their office has like brought it to their attention. That's a really good point. Um, and uh... I want to move, move on from that too, but I also wanted to point out um, someone in the chat had mentioned something very helpful. This is from Daniel Snyder, and they had said like um, one suggestion they have is that they really like it when they join a new company or team that they share a one pager that contains information like their identity, their communication and work, spot, work style management that they thrive under so that it's kind of easy, accessible way for colleague, new colleagues and other leaders to understand what to expect as well. So that's also kind of a low stakes, very um, low stakes and I guess welcoming and easy way for people to understand you um, if they may be shy or not sure how to reach out and try to understand your, your working style uh, further. So I really like that, I wanted to call that out. Uh, this question was from Anahita and they had asked, um, they had a question on how do you design screen readers buttons to make it more meaningful then um, would it be a brief description in the alt text or an aria explaining what the purpose of the button is i think we were mentioning about like sea of buttons everywhere and it doesn't explain the context so you're kind of just lost at that part of the uh, experience it's very uh unhelpful yeah i think this one is kind of for me uh, <laughs> because i brought it up uh so the the idea is that you know we contextualize a lot of things visually so if you are looking at a section on a page that has a header um, that says, you know, for instance, like diet sodas, and then you have a shop now button, it should say shop diet sodas now um, when you read it. Because as a visual, per, like as a visual user, I am contextualizing that button with the information that surrounds it. And we know that if there's a bad hierarchy that you know, and then the button's like associated with something that it's not supposed to be, the people will be confused. So the same thing happens with the screen reader is if it's associated with a, a wrong thing that it, it just doesn't make sense to people that are navigating the site. Uh, another thing that to mention about it is that it's usually an, uh, it is an ARIA label, but it's usually something that like 
is the um, the name of the button as well. So you can have you know like classes and and titles of things, and so it's usually the the button title that uh, is really important. So this this gets into kind of like technical details, which you can work out with people. But that's it's like a huge one that I think would make a big difference on a lot of websites, which is why I was like, let's answer this definitely. Yeah, no, I like that it does. It is specific, but it also seems like very small effort that, like you said, has a high amount of impact that you can make part of your um, design process and style too, where it's just like just additional context here. Um, and, it, and it goes a long way. Um, we have a question from Bobby and they had asked, for cognitive accessibility uh, for research sessions, how do you balance not priming and giving them appropriate knowledge to be accommodating? This could be for anybody. Like, um, do you mean like asking them beforehand if they need an accommodation or? Um... Yeah, for, see, make sure I understand that for cognitive accessibility for research sessions, how do you balance not priming and giving them appropriate knowledge to be accommodating? So how do you balance accommodations with um, with uh, user research, not priming or leading them to, to ensure that the feedback and the data is also um, is as uh, unprimed as possible, if that makes sense. Um, if Bobby is here as well, like also welcome them to um, you and add more context to it too. That's from what I understand of the question. I think I understand. Oh, Sonia, I just saw you come off mute if you want to answer it. No, I, I like to ask questions, like if I'm understanding, and of course, Bobby, please interrupt us if not, um, is what would you expect to find here? Uh, how might you uh, click <clears throat> on this link or whatever? I mean, so I try to like do more of those kinds of questions um if i'm trying to not provide context and then i also like to get the the questions um reviewed by other teammates who might have better uh cognitive bias reviews so that they're looking at things from a different lens yeah thank you and then i know we had uh Sora and i saw you answer this in the chat about um uh, ada had asked about uh, screening and oh, let me make sure I can find it. Yeah, um, uh, it was asked oh, yeah. if if you can ask people if they have a disability when you're when you're screening, and the answer is yes. I would say be careful about your disclaimers where you say that this information isn't going to be shared. You're not going to repeat it. I have a dis a standard disclaimer that I put on all my screeners that say like, uh, your information if shared intern like it's only going to be used for our internal teams and if it's shared internally it'll be aggregate and anonymized um, but just to go a step further you can ask if people use an ass assistive technology then you're not asking if they have a disability at all or if they have a certain disability uh, you're just looking for users that use that technology which you can get some different perspectives that way um, from people that are you know even just like expert testers that happen to use screen readers and that can even give you more perspective than someone that is simply a visual user that's navigating the website. Thank you for that. And then um, I think this will be our last question. And this is from Michaela and they had asked, it seems like it's just like a general, I'm trying to understand your thoughts on, um, are Apple products considered to be really good um, or some of the best for accessibility? Um, for example, is um, Safari has a screen reader voiceover to maximize um, and there's font size changing, which seems like the bare minimum. So it's like kind of what is your personal take on Apple products and accessibility and achieving that for their users, if you have personal thoughts on that. I, I can say something to that um, because I use my phone almost exclusively um, for these different tools and, and such. Um, I can click on speak and I will highlight different texts that I want to read so I don't have to go through a lot of the prompts that a screen reader would usually go through. So like the click through and the labels and button, 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 <laughs> and those kinds of things. Um, so I think it actually is one of the better ones out there because there is some tone and intonation. It's not, 
it's not necessarily a des uh, this desirable or a comparable experience, but it's not so um, monotone that I can't follow and understand what uh, the context is saying. So I think it's good for my specific disability, but you know, different people may have different perspectives on their products. Yeah, I would I would say that from my perspective. Apple puts a lot into accessibility. They have a, a really, really big accessibility team that's constantly putting out features. It's something that they're very dedicated to. And uh, I find that a lot of their, their OS level, uh, I'm sorry, operating system le level um, features are really, really good. But caveat, if developers don't build in names into their buttons, then it just reads button. Like you have to build things in a way that works with the OS in order for any operating system, it doesn't matter if it's Apple or Android or Windows or whatever to work. So um, there's there's just that caveat of it doesn't, it, Apple isn't going to make an inaccessible app work magically. Right, the onus is still on the, on the teams creating products and the services to put in that level of effort. And with you uh, all sharing, helpful sources like Stark, it also kind of answers the question of like, there are gaps to there are additional tools and plugins that you can use to maximize that and not just rely on um, the like Apple products to handle it for us. Okay, with that, I want to thank you all for sharing your time with us and uh, your valuable wisdom. I want everybody to thank our speakers, crazy in the chat. And yeah, it was so awesome. We learned so much. I was like, furiously like, all right, this is really good, helpful resources. So um, what I've done throughout the event is I've gathered all the helpful, um, you know, community announcement links, the job links, as well as the helpful resources that our speakers and attendees in the chat have uh, shared into a nice uh, formatted list. And we'll be sharing them out afterwards as well, as long, along with the recording that will be made available within a week. So you can all relive this fun time that we've shared mm -hmm. together. One one question I wanted yes. to ask Soren before we hang up. Soren, have you, and, and Sonia as well, have, have either of you used the um, Ally plugin in Figma? I think I know what you're talking about. And it's, I believe it's the contrast checker and it maybe does like some of the same things that Stark does with like yes. the yes. landmarks and things. Yes. Totally. Yeah. I used it a little bit. I, so I've, I've definitely used Stark too. I, I actually will use both to make sure that I'm catching everything. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there as like another yeah. uh, plugin for Figma. I don't know if it works for other, for Sketch or anyone else, but um, I'm sure. So folks CJ is the that. Ally Color Contrast Checker plugin? That's okay. I got, I got the link. I'll add, add it to the list. Thank you for yeah. sharing. And, it's like, as just like an FYI, if you're on the Figma community and you're looking at plugins, always look at the last time it was updated um, because oh. that will tell you if it's actually worth using or not. Because if it's been like four years, like it's gonna be a no for me, dog. That's the exact same thing for like, um, when I was using Sketch and the plugin Sue, it's like, no, you have this very fragile ecosystem of like Sketch and then plugins. And if one of them are out of date and they just stop updating it, then you're kind of left out in the in the dark with that. So yeah. And I do want to just put one one last plugin for um, Twitter is a really amazing space. If you're not on Twitter, um, design Twitter, UX Twitter is just a really wonderful place. You know, there's hot takes galore, but there's also um, really wonderful people who are willing to help you out, who are willing to give you their time. I've had nothing but amazing experiences with folks when I need something reviewed um, and people are very willing to, to help you out. And it's very, and the ADHD community there is like so amazing. So definitely uh, yeah. you can add me on, on Twitter, Ms. Punk and Pants. So I'll, I'll put my handle in the chat. Yeah, and Havana mentioned that uh, she learns a lot from disability Twitter as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With that, I think we would like to conclude, Havana. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, speakers. Um, speakers and co-organizers, feel free to stay on unless you uh, need to leave. That's fine. Um, totally fine. And everyone, uh, our next event, well, events, is going to be that happy hour, the Barks and Brew um, event is going to be on May 12th. And I believe the uh, the next meetup is going to be on uh, in May. It's every every third Thursday, every month. And that is going to be on enterprise research ops. So that should be very good. Uh, very excited about that. And that's going to be May 19th. So hope you can make it and have a good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>